Hey, Howard here. Shooting things is fun. <laughs> Moving quickly is fun too. I'm fast as fuck, boy. So it stands to reason that shooting things while moving quickly is double fun, right? Yes. Yes it is. By the way, have you ever wanted to have a seizure? This is Post Void, an arcade-style shoot-em-up with a heavy emphasis on speed and giving anyone with photosensitive epilepsy a fast pass to the grave. A game with reviews such as, great game. Not for people with epilepsy. Or <laughs> brain rot. Seriously, that little warning blurb at the start of the video, that's not a joke at all. Okay, I'm waiting for the punchline. There is no punchline. It's not a joke. Leave now, or you will probably die. Oh my god, Peter, are you alright? Post Void is a game that I found while working on my We Happy Few video. It started consuming my thoughts as I was working on that video, to the point that it was actually a motivator to keep progressing so that I could play it. Now I'll admit, I'm not the biggest fan of fast-paced first-person shooter games. This is mostly because I suck at them. and I have very little experience with them as a result. But something about this game stuck out to me. Watching the trailer, I was immediately reminded of 1993's major success, Doom. Something about the cramped corridors and the extreme violence of it all, but I could tell this wasn't Doom. Obviously inspired by it, but not an outright copy. Seeing those gross hands gripping a strange head-shaped object, the speed with which the levels were played through, the entire art style of it all, needless to say, it piqued my interest quite a bit. Looking at the Steam page only pushed me further towards the edge. Try not to look back too much. Try to avoid lingering on mistakes. You will make mistakes. Each achievement presents a new challenge as the last one dwarfs to our ambition. Uh, literally, what does that even mean? I was hooked completely. I hadn't been this sold on a game in a long time. I looked and to my surprise, the game was only $3. This is the best purchase I've ever made in my whole life. Booting the game up, we're sent immediately into the tutorial, learning the basics of movement and the gunplay before stepping into a pool of light where we're presented with the first of two cutscenes. First, there was the void. Then, there was a headache. And a flower of hope that would give birth to a sanctuary. Which has head in hand, he who bore the pain would try to reach the void again. The place where nothing moves, where darkness is lord and silence its preacher, a place of peace. There, his head can pour freely onto a new seed which, with renewed purpose, will sprout life. But alas, ceaseless violence and unapologetic noise would again be wallpapered to the corridors of past serenity. A time known as Post Void, a place known as Post Void. From this, we understand that the story revolves around the player trying to find peace in the void, but the road to it will most likely be bloody as the place and time known as Post Void has spawned immeasurable violence. But the story does not matter at all. This game, in contrast to my last video, focuses on gameplay over the story, and with this type of game, it works great. It follows the Doom approach of having kick-ass gameplay with the story taking a backseat, only really there for the people who really want it. It works especially well given the arcadey nature of Post Void, a game with nearly infinite amounts of replayability. Post Void's levels are procedurally generated, meaning that each room is different every go-around, and enemies are also dotted around sorta of randomly, but honestly, do you really care? Cause I kinda don't. The main selling point of this game is the insanely fun gameplay, so let's get to it. YCJY Games, the creators of Post Void, made a tweet about a month ago saying, We had a design page for Post Void, but it was more of a cryptic poem with the words stress underlined. This could not be more true. This game is hectic, especially later on when you're putting 100% of your focus in so that you don't choke the winning run. Okay, but like, let's get real for a second. What the hell is happening over in Scandinavia? The Finns have Cruelty Squad and the Swedes have Post Void. Is there something in the drinking water over there? What's happening? Starting your first round, you're probably gonna get destroyed. Mm. 
Yeah, you're gonna die a lot in the early hours, especially if you suck like I do. This game is hard, not just on the eyes, but in terms of gameplay as well. It took me like 50 tries to get past the first level. Dying is quick and easy in this game, literally only lasting 2 or 3 seconds max unless you want to look at your stats. Kills, time, the level you were on, headshots, accuracy, and how many times you were hit, all contributing to the final score, with reaching the epilogue and beating the game, adding a cool 10,000 bonus points to it. The tutorial gives you very rudimentary instruction, but after that you're completely on your own. There's a lot that it doesn't cover, like that you can use your slide to slide under incoming bullets, or that there's a manual reload. Like, this should be obvious, and I'm kind of embarrassed to admit it, but I didn't realize there was a manual reload option until after like 30 deaths caused by not having enough bullets in the chamber. Spawning in, you're equipped with a pistol, which holds 6 shots before needing to be reloaded, and the idol. This is definitely something that immediately grabbed my attention because it's just so cool. You may have noticed that there's really no standard HUD, no oh, health bar or anything, instead being replaced with the idol. Your health is measured through the amount of liquid in the idol, which is constantly draining through the neck hole. Doing nothing, the idol will run out of liquid in about 9 seconds. When the idol is full out of liquid, a countdown will start, and if no more liquid is put into it, it shatters and you die. Obviously, taking damage will reduce the time even further, and if you take damage while the countdown is running, you will die instantly. The only way to get more liquid is to kill enemies. Killing an enemy will add about 3 seconds worth of liquid to your idol. It changes depending on the enemy you kill, some will give less, but every kill gives you at least a little bit. This is why speed is so important in this game. The more enemies you kill in the shortest amount of time while taking the least damage, the longer your idol stays intact. The only other way to get more liquid is to beat the level, stepping into another pool of light which fills the idol completely. In total, there are 11 levels in a playthrough, all separated into 3 acts. Act 1 consists of levels 1 to 3, Act 2 of 4 to 6, and Act 3 of 7 to 10, with level 11 being the epilogue. The acts separate the levels to let you know that things are getting harder, with each act adding new enemies and more challenge to the levels. The challenge comes in the form of extra floors in the level. It adds some challenge because enemies can sometimes be waiting for you perched up on the ledge you need to jump up to or at the bottom where you need to jump down, which can catch you by surprise if you're not ready for it. Enemies also increase in difficulty and number as you progress, with Act 1 consisting of only 2 or 3 enemy types which are only dotted around the levels and Act 3 throwing everything it has at you with harder, more dangerous enemies spawned in denser quantities. And speaking of enemies, black suits are the first enemies you'll encounter in Post Void. They're the perfect introduction enemy as they're pretty slow and easy to dodge relative to the later enemies. They're equipped with a pistol and will shoot on sight. Post Void doesn't have any sort of warning that an enemy's nearby or if they can see you. They'll just be camped around a corner waiting for you to peek over and will shoot you even if you don't see them, so it's always best to be expecting one. Black suits also dodge periodically, so be ready for that too. They start off in level 1 and go all the way until Act 3, where they're replaced by another enemy that we'll talk about later. Also, they remind me of the squid in a suit skin from Minecraft. I honestly wouldn't be surprised if it was a direct inspiration for their design. Flamingos are an enemy that are introduced in level 2. I, uh, I can see the resemblance. They're a part of the enemy roster all the way to the end, and they're extremely fast to the point that any sort of pause in your movement will let them catch up and take a bite out of you. Yeah. Literally. They're a melee only enemy, which in a game filled with enemies that shoot you, don't sound too dangerous on paper, but the thing is, Postboard has a slowdown on contact mechanics, so if you run past a flamingo without killing it, since this game has such an emphasis on speed, it's sometimes smart to bypass certain enemies to get through the level faster, which gets you more points, and you round the corner into the face of a black suit or another flamingo, it'll kill your momentum instantly, and then you're pretty much f***ed. It's probably best to just kill these things, actually. Also, they have boobies, so that's cool too, I guess. Crying mouths are enemies that hang from the walls or ceiling and shoot a barrage of bullets at you. They start spawning in level 1 along with the black suits, but they don't pose any sort of threat until Act 2, since in Act 1 they only spawn in the large open rooms, while in Act 2 they spawn in the cramped corridors. They can be pretty deadly in the later stages and are not to be underestimated, as I often did the first few times I got that far. Act 2 adds two new enemies, with one of them being the Telehand. These little guys aren't too bad, they often spawn in groups, and I found that they like to camp on ledges where you can't see them until it's too late. They're mainly melee enemies, so accidentally running into a group of them is like stepping into a glue trap. Painfully slow and deadly. That's the thing with the melee enemies in this game. The slowdown effect allows them to keep hitting you until you manage to break free, meaning that if you're caught in a situation like that, you'll escape with half your health gone, and that's being generous. The Post Void Wiki says that these guys are melee only, but I'm like 99% sure that I've seen them shooting at me. The second enemy introduced in Act 2 is the Flesh Wall, which before I even show it to you, just guess what it looks like. 
Yeah, of course, it's a wall made of flesh, who could have guessed? Anyway, these are one of the only enemies that don't attack you, instead slowing you down by blocking the way to the exit. They can also block dead ends as a sort of red herring, but the way to the end is obvious enough that you'll pretty much never be fooled once you're familiarized with the general path you need to go down. I haven't mentioned it yet, but most enemies die in one shot if it's a headshot. How about the blow? The flesh wall is no exception, but it has a much bigger punishment if you miss the weak point. With someone like the black suit, if you miss a headshot, no problem, just aim for the head again. If you miss the flesh wall's head and hit it in, like, its arm, it'll cover its face, forcing you to pretty much unload the entire magazine into them before they go down. Unless your aim is really, really bad, these guys are free. Act 3, just like Act 2, adds two new enemies. One of them is by far the most annoying, the bulb hand. It, just like the flesh wall, can't hurt you, instead opting to blind you for a few moments. You can bypass this flash by getting far enough away to be out of its range, break line of sight around a corner or ledge, or just kill it. Do not underestimate them. Because all the walls look so similar, looking around a bit while blind can get you completely turned around. There have been numerous times where I got flashed, got confused, and ended up running back the way I came, only to realize and die because there were no enemies to farm liquid from. Kill these guys if you can help it. The final enemy is a fairly familiar face. The white suits. They replace the black suits and are much more deadly. They shoot much faster and dodge more frequently. They would be a super giant threat, and they still are if you're not careful, but at this point in the game you're likely much more powerful. How? Reaching the end of a level, you're presented with an upgrade selection screen. There are only 3 to choose from at a time, but there are 12 total, with some being able to stack. If you select an upgrade that can't be stacked, it'll get removed from the selection pool for the rest of the run. 3 of the upgrades are weapons, with the rest improving your guns or the world. If you'll remember, you start out with the pistol. Once you select a new gun to replace it, you can't get it back until you die and start a new run. Honestly, there's never any need to switch back to the pistol anyway, as it's only really good for the first act. After that, it becomes less and less viable to the point that you're actually sabotaging yourself by not choosing a new weapon. The shotgun is the best weapon in the game. I'm very biased, of course, because no matter what the game is, if it's a first-person shooter and there's a shotgun, I will never switch off of it. Whether it be Doom, Blood, Dusk, any game that has a shotgun. I don't have a problem, I can quit whenever I want. The shotgun holds two shells and has a fairly long reload time. It's perfect for dealing with the Talahans, says because they spawn in groups, the shotgun spread means it's super easy to take out multiple, if not all of them, in a single shot. It also completely nullifies the need to hit headshots. With a pistol, even a black suit took three shots to take down with no headshots, which isn't really conducive to the whole killing things quick shtick. With the shotgun, literally every enemy in firing range is a one-shot kill. This is balanced by the fact that you can only shoot twice before having to reload, where you're completely defenseless. I'm gonna say something controversial, I did not care for the Uzi. It felt very much like a spray and pray weapon at first, as opposed to the pistol, which required good accuracy to hit those headshots or the shotgun with its crazy power. I just felt like it was pretty meh, but knowing that I was going to make a video on this game, I used it more until I was fairly comfortable. It's still not my favorite, I still hold it in lower standing than the shotgun, but I like to use it now. It's definitely a great choice. The knife seems like a joke weapon. In a game where everyone's shooting you, you have a melee weapon. Never bring a knife to a gunfight unless you're Leon from Resident Evil 4. Bit of advice. Kill yourself. Much like how the flamingos can initially be seen as weaker than the other enemies that shoot but are in fact quite deadly, you quickly come to realize that the knife is much more lethal than you might think. Using this weapon, you're forced to be much more evasive. Bullets are fairly easy to dodge early on seeing as the enemies are fewer in number, and with an upgrade that I'll mention soon, the projectiles become even easier to dodge even in the later levels. You can strafe to the sides to skirt by them, or if you're quick about it, slide under them, giving you a more direct route to your target and getting there a bit quicker. One thing to note about sliding under bullets, you have to wait until after the bullet is shot to slide. If you're sliding while you're being shot at, the bullets will be moving at a downward angle to where you can no longer slide under it. The knife can one-shot every enemy, but that really isn't the greatest upside, seeing as every gun can do that as well without the need to get up close and personal. The knife is definitely the worst pick for casual play, unless you're just dicking around or going for a challenge run. It is the weapon of choice for speedrunners, though. Don't know if it's for speed purposes or if it's just a flex, but hey, whatever works. The main thing to remember, though, no matter the weapon, is to always be prepared. If no enemies are around and you've used up some of your ammo, reload so that you're not caught out with no bullets in the chamber. Ammo is unlimited, so you never have to worry about wasting bullets and then having to scavenge for more. With the pistol, reloading is pretty negligible, seeing as the reload speed for it is, like, less than a second. And with a knife, obviously it doesn't need to be reloaded, but by holding left click you can charge up a big slash, meaning that when you see another enemy, you'll be ready to one-shot them. Of course, new weapons are great and all, but with the weapon upgrades, they become so much more powerful. 
Four of the 12 total upgrades are for your weapons, and they're all super good. Rubber Bullets is one of the best upgrades in the game. It allows you to be much more imprecise with your aiming, as you can literally be aiming at a wall, nowhere near the enemy, and get a well-deserved headshot. It meshes extremely well with the Uzi, because if you ever get overwhelmed, you can literally just start shooting with no rhyme or reason, and most of the time, everyone will die. You can also shoot the wall before rounding a corner, which can sometimes net you a cheap kill. Reload Speed is a very important upgrade, as it lets you, well, reload faster, obviously. Moron. It makes a significant difference, since reloading is the most dangerous action in this game apart from slowing down, since you're completely defenseless while doing so. The less time you spend vulnerable, the better. Bigger Clips, again, is fairly obvious in what it does. It adds some bullets to the pool, adding one shell for the shotgun, three bullets for the pistol, and it doesn't even really matter for the Uzi since it feels like it has a bottomless clip anyway. The extra few bullets are a godsend, as it can often be the difference between life and death. If you have a group of enemies and you beef two shots with your shotgun because you suck, usually you're dead yep, as you'd have to reload, me. but now with an extra shell you can make a comeback yep, and kill at least me. one, often giving you enough liquid to survive. This upgrade along with reload speed can stack, meaning that you'll get more bullets or faster reload speed. Do I even have to explain this? Come on now. Obviously these last three upgrades have no effect on the knife, so if you're using it, a melee weapon, and you're picking these upgrades that deal with bullets, you're trolling or stupid. Explosive ammo is absolutely the best upgrade in the game, a little bit ahead of rubber bullets in my opinion. Every time you kill an enemy, it'll explode, dealing damage to, if not outright killing, any surrounding enemies. This makes telehands even easier to deal with. Since they spawn in groups, one explosion will usually carry through the rest of them, killing them all. Explosive ammo meshes super well with the shotgun, since you can kill multiple enemies with the shotgun sometimes anyway, the explosives just add so much more carnage. And unlike the other weapon upgrades, this one works with the knife. The final upgrade type are the miscellaneous upgrades. These are things that improve your character's abilities or affect the world in some way. Ghost is a choice upgrade for speedrunners as it reduces slowdown on contact. This is great for them as most of the speedrun is just running past enemies and the less time spent caught the better. For casual players, it's not as important of an upgrade because usually you'll be trying to kill as many enemies as possible, but the same point applies. The less time spent caught, the better. The longer you're stuck in an enemy, phrasing, the more times they'll attack you. Getting out sooner means you won't take as much damage. Slow Bullets is a top tier upgrade. It slows down the bullets of all enemies. It makes the later levels infinitely easier. Enemies that can sometimes be a pain like the crying mouths and the white suits are just completely destroyed by this upgrade. I mean, don't get me wrong, they're still super dangerous, but much, much less less so. Serious mode sucks. <laughs> it's the second worst upgrade in the game. It increases your movement speed significantly, but only if you're moving backwards. This means it's not really useful at all since you won't be able to attack if you're not able to see your enemies. I think it's especially telling that the speedrunners don't use it. If you have something that's a direct upgrade to speed, but even the speedrunners think it's bad, you know it just sucks. I assumed the idea was to make backpedaling away from enemies when you need to reload or something easier, but your base backwards movement speed is enough to still outpace even the flamingos. It can make evading bullets easier in the early hours while you're still fresh, I guess? but after you know how to evade effectively, this upgrade becomes literally worthless. I mean, even in the early hours, I never found it useful at all, but maybe that's just because I'm goaded. That's why he's the goat! The goat! <laughs> Big Idle is a good upgrade, allowing more liquid to be stored in the idle at a time. It gives you a lot more wiggle room in the late levels, allowing you to take more damage or just play it safe, focusing more on avoiding damage while you fill up the idle. The last upgrade is the best in the entire game, something completely game-changing that only an idiot would pass it up. This upgrade fucking sucks. The compass is literally never useful in any instance. It points towards the end of the level, as you might expect, but since the path from the start of the level to the end is pretty much a straight line, like the levels aren't maze-like or anything, there's really just never any need to use this. And on top of how useless it is, it actively sabotages you by making you look up at the top of the screen at the indicator. This is a game that requires your focus, so having something like the compass distracting you is a great way to catch a bullet to the face and die. Honestly, all these upgrades are useful to agree, except maybe for the compass. Fuck the compass. If I had to rank all the upgrades for how I like to play the game, the list would probably go something like this. It's important to remember that these upgrades come in pairs of three after every level, so you have to weigh your options. Like if you get three godlike upgrades, you can only pick one of them, and there's no guarantee that the other two will come back later in the run. There's also the factor of non-stackable upgrades getting removed from the selection pool completely. So in the beginning, where the levels are super easy, you could make the decision to sacrifice an upgrade and pick the compass so that it won't appear in the later levels, effectively making it more likely that you'll get better upgrades 
upgrades there where you'll need them the most. Honestly, I tried that strat a few times and it never really seemed to help. It just felt like I was throwing away an upgrade. And speaking of throwing away upgrades, if you're a true chad who finds relying on anything except for your own primal sigma strength pathetic, you can forego the upgrades altogether and just raw dog the levels with the base pistol and your animal instincts to show everyone that you're the chattiest chad in them all. I, I couldn't do it. I, I tried. I, I could not do it. Sorry, sorry chat community, I'm, I'm not one of you. Also, there's an extra upgrade in the game's files called Wide Eyes. It doesn't appear in the game, and I was curious about it, so I decided to toss a tweet at YCGAY Games, and to my surprise, I got an answer. It increased the FOV, but we always picked it because it made the game more fun, so we ended up just making that the standard FOV and removing the upgrade. It's always cool to find scrapped or reworked stuff like that. It kind of feels like you're taking a peek behind the curtain at things you shouldn't be able to see. Probably because that's literally just what you're doing. God, this script sucks. Post Void Story deals with you making your way to the void, and that's reflected in the progression of the rooms. The levels in Act 1 are comically vibrant, with colors that are really in your face, with levels 1, 2, and 3 having bright orange, yellow, and pink walls respectively. Act 2 has a much more washed out, dull color palette, still colorful, just much less so in relation to Act 1. It almost looked like wallpaper, as opposed to Act 1, which is completely disconnected from any semblance of reality. Act 3 completely loses the vibrancy of the other acts instead being filled with whites, grays, and blacks. I don't know how to describe it, but this act looks sort of gothic? I don't think that's the right word, but whatever. <sighs> I don't care. The verticality also changes through each of these acts. Act 1's levels are almost completely flat, save for the jump to reach the pool of light at the end. Act 2's levels have another layer added, and Act 3 adds yet another layer. It adds a lot more enjoyment to the game, since if all the levels played exactly the same, this game would be a snooze fest. After beating the three acts, you're taken to the epilogue, which takes place in the forest, similar to the tutorial area. Finding the void, you walk up to the flower from the intro, break the idol over it, and it blooms, ending the game. Beating the game, nothing really happens. The score screen changes from static with eyes and mouths from when you die to a static screen that blooms flowers. You can actually let this go for a while and the flowers will completely fill the screen. Kinda cool. You get an extra 10,000 points for completing it, and on the main menu screen you can check the leaderboard to look at all the people who know life the game and see your position on the leaderboard. My high score as of writing this script is 61,315 at position 12,279. Yeah, I'm kinda the greatest, what can I say? I think Post Void Story is a time loop. Like, I don't know for sure, this is just how the game struck me. Tinfoil hats on, it's theory time. This game has two main settings, the void and post void. Yeah, the game setting is the same as the name, it's confusing. In the void rests a flower that creates a sanctuary, a flower which the main character breaks the idol over to create life. This life becomes violent, making lots of noise in the place that was the sanctuary. This life resides in post void. The main character was likely birthed from this flower, and his headache was likely caused by the noise and the violence. So he goes to the flower to free himself from the pain which causes the sanctuary to be birthed along with the new violent life in post void along with the main character. His headache is caused by the violence, so he goes to the flower to free himself of the pain which causes the sanctuary to be birthed along with the new violent life in post void along with the main character. His headache is caused by the violence, so he goes to the flower to free himself from the pain which causes the sanctuary to be birthed along with the new violent life in post void along with the main character. Actually, saying that out loud, it's pretty apparent that that's probably the actual story. Who knows, maybe I'm wrong, but it would fit into the arcade style gameplay where you beat the game and go right back into a new run where you beat the game and go right back into a new run again. And also the fact that each level is procedurally generated, which could be the world being rebuilt after the main character empties the idol over the flower. This is the real tinfoil hat part of the analysis though. Going back to the rooms and how they got progressively less vibrant the closer to the void they were, maybe life was confined to the areas in Act 3 until people moved farther out into the world, into the levels of Act 2 and 1. You might notice that the levels get progressively older looking as you approach the void, with Act 3 looking super old, again, gothic, still don't know if that's right, still don't care, Act 2 looking more modern, like wallpaper you might find in an older house, and Act 1 looking strange, like nothing we've seen in the real world. It seems almost like an allegory of progression and evolution. In the 12th to 16th century, Europe had these great gothic structures, which are large and magnificent, reflected in Act 3 with how big and windy the levels are. Act 2's levels look almost like what some of us would have today, sort of like a twisted, f***ed up version of a house. Act 1 is the most alien looking, maybe showing how we'll evolve to enjoy new architecture we couldn't even dream of right now. Verticality plays into this as well, as gothic architecture was tall and Act 3 has the most verticality, and most houses only having one to two floors, with Act 2 only having two layers as well. Also the fact that with evolution, evolution comes simplicity. It's a well-known fact that life gets easier over time. 
Act 3 is the oldest, the gothic era, and as such is the trickiest to traverse. Act 2 is in the middle, nearly our time, and is difficult at times but nowhere near like Act 3. And Act 1 is the newest, sometime in the future, being the simplest to move through and being the easiest to complete consistently. This is definitely me just scouring for anything else to talk about and is most certainly really far out there but I think it's cool nonetheless. I wish I could talk more about the lore, but I literally can't. Maybe I missed something obvious, but story is so limited in this game as it's just not very important. The gameplay takes precedence, which honestly, yeah. These games, the short, quick little experiences with a bunch of replay value, function just fine with no story as they're built around the gameplay, unlike something like my last video where the game is built around the story. Last thing, this game has no real soundtrack, just one song. It's a f***ing banger, dude. It perfectly fits the game, and I've listened to this song for like 10 hours, still not tired of it. The song actually got a limited vinyl release with only 200 copies being pressed. I literally can't find this for sale anywhere, but oh my god, I want this so bad. Anyway, this game is super fun. Finding the perfect combinations of upgrades, learning the ins and outs of how everything works, getting a feel for the movement, it's all incredibly, well, just incredible. Seriously, this game is only three bucks. If it looked fun at all, buy it. It is totally worth it. I'll link the Steam page in the description, obviously. The only complaint I can make is that the game is super short. It only took me about an hour and a half to beat the game for the first time. Of course, there's a lot of replayability and learning to master all the weapons, going for challenge runs like no upgrades or knife only, or just going back to try and beat your high score. Buy the game. Like, if you aren't, you're genuinely playing yourself. Seriously. Buy the damn game. Thank you so much for watching. Like the video if you liked it, dislike it if you didn't, subscribe if you want to, don't if you don't. I've been Howard, and I'll see you when I see you.